Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar, Choose Wisely You Must, Method Selection for Probiotic Enumeration and Identification. This webinar will be hosted by Anjay Binkowski and Anthony Kiefer. I'm Genevieve Randall, and I'll be moderating this webinar. The webinar is being recorded, and the slides and recording will be available for you within three business days. A short Q&A session will follow the presentation to answer any viewer-submitted questions. During the webinar, you can submit questions you have using the webinar sidebar menu. Select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit enter on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions throughout the webinar. Okay, Anthony, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, my name is Anthony Kiefer. I am a probiotic development manager at IFF and it's located in our Madison, Wisconsin site. And I want to talk today about method selection for enumeration and identification of probiotics and how it's really specific for our IFF portfolio. So, Anjay, if you want to go to slide number two for me. I'm going to give a, a broad overview to start of the IFF probiotic portfolio. Then I'm going to move on and talk about identification of our probiotics. Uh, and I'm going to uh, focus specifically on our strain specific identification methods, which are captioned in USP monographs. After that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to enumerate our probiotics. And I'm going to introduce a couple of new techniques that we're working on, including a genus specific method and some uh, DD PCR techniques or droplet digital PCR techniques, if you're unfamiliar. We'll probably save thoughts and comments for the end, but I do want to save some time for thank yous and then uh, some references in case people are interested in, in reading further into the, some of the literature that I use in my presentation. So you can progress to slide three, please. The portfolio at IFF is, is much broader than just probiotics, but today we're here to talk about probiotics. And we have over 100 years of experience in probiotics with more than 600 scientific publications and more than 70 clinical studies on probiotics alone. We boast high stability, and that's due to a combination of efficient fermentation, drying processes, and patent-protected stability technology, and that ensures perfectly active probiotics in optimal forms. We formulate only using the best probiotic strains and combinations to ensure your product delivers the results you desire. We have expertise in digestive, immune, brain, oral, and women's health and weight management, to name a few, but that is ever expanding. And then our, our portfolio currently offers around, you know, more than 25 actually unique strains from over 10 different genera. Can progress to slide number four. So to start with probiotic identification, some things that you need to know as you know a consumer or a customer or someone who's formulating with probiotics is that there are multiple different identification techniques that exist and that they're not all created equally. Some terms that you may have heard or be familiar with are 16S rRNA, riboprinting, strain-specific PCR, MALDI-TOF, and API kits, but there are others. Um, and these are all commonly used within the industry. But differences in applicability and specificity must be considered. And we have to understand when selecting the correct method uh, that it's, an, it's really important when ensuring accurate identification. And some labs may not have knowledge or expertise, specifically in IFF probiotics or products, to understand how to accurately identify our probiotics. And so to demonstrate that fact, on the bottom of the screen, we have a product, uh, How Are You Restore? And so if you see this product contains two bifidobacterium lactis strains, BIO7 and BLO4. Now, if you wanted to identify, for example, BIO7 in this blend, and you chose 16S sequencing, 16S rRNA sequencing as your method of detection, what you would find is that you can't uniquely identify BIO7 in this blend because BIO7 and BLO4 have a 100% identity match for the 16S region. So choosing this method may give you a false positive, in fact, that BIO7 is present when you could just be identifying BLO4. And so this is one simple example of why the correct method choice is really important. And having someone with expertise in IFF portfolio of products and, and really the genomes for identification is important. We can progress to slide number five. 
So I want to give a brief overview of each of the techniques that, that I, I just introduced so that everyone has a, an overall understanding of what, the, what it means when you request this type of identification. 16S rRNA sequencing, sequencing excuse me, has a level of distinction at the species or subspecies level. It's based on variable regions of a gene called the 16S gene. Uh, and this is often used, and at IFF, it is used for confirmation of identity and, and quality release. It's also used for identification of contaminants. Another technique that's typically used at IFF and used for quality release is riboprinting. This has a, 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 a maybe slightly more specific level of distinction, which is at species and subspecies level, but can sometimes distinguish um, strain depending on how unique the fingerprint that is created from riboprinting is. And this is based on bands which are generated after digestion with a restriction enzyme. So the, the genome is, is broken up by these restriction enzymes and depending on where the restriction enzyme cuts the DNA, because where that, that region exists in the genome creates a unique riboprint or sometimes we just call it a fingerprint. And this is also used for identification of contaminants at IFF. Now, PCR assays, which we've captured in USP monographs, have a level of distinction, at, at least for the ones that we've designed and, and incorporated into the USP monographs, are at the strain level. And they're based on unique genomic sequences. So we use those for strain-specific identification when that's necessary. We also use it for identifying contaminants. But most importantly, it's used for single strain identification and multi strain products, but also matrices. So, you know, we could use it in yogurt or something similar, a fermented food, for example. So, moving on to the next slide, slide number six. MALDI TOF is something that you may have heard of. It stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight, the mouthful, which is why it's referred to as MALDI TOF. It, the level of distinction is species or sometimes strain level, so a little bit more specific again. It's based on protein or biomolecule typing. We're not typically using that for quality release, but it can be used in some non-quality settings for confirmation of identity and also for strain characterization. So it can, it can identify some unique biomolecules if that's what we're interested in, in finding or identifying. And then there are also API kits. These have a level of distinction which are based on carbohydrate utilization. It's an older technique that was um, initially used to identify probiotics before genomics was widely uh, available. And we still use that occasionally for strain characterization to understand what carbo carbohydrates are probiotics utilized. But mostly we use that to confirm external lab results. So if some customers will st still send out for the testing. We may follow up or confirm or refute those results by performing our own API test. Progress to slide number seven. So what we're seeing in the industry is really this increase in identity requirements. And it's coming from a range of different um, stressors, I would call them. But one of the main ones being health claims and important mechanism, mechanisms of action, which are often strain specific. So on the bottom right, we have a figure from um, Hill and co-authors published in 2014, which shows how some widespread probiotic effects can be applied generally to all probiotic strains. Above that in green, you have um, species level effects, which can include things like vitamin synthesis, gut barrier reinforcement, and, and then on top, which is really what we're, we're all striving for, and we're all striving for mode of action or really unique probiotic application are these strain-specific effects. And that can range from neurological effects, immuno immunological effects, endocrinological, and uh, production, production of specific bioactives. So this is what companies are really looking for, and these types of benefits are often strain-specific. Another issue is when you're manufacturing highly clonal probiotic strains, which are strains that are very genetically similar, there's a risk of undetectable cross-contamination or even misidentification because the identification techniques that are used are not specific enough to distinguish the two, and therefore you could end up misidentifying. And then there's also technological advances in whole genome sequencing and Sanger sequencing, which have made you know, more 
specific assays possible. And all these, these factors have pushed regulatory and standard setting bodies to move towards requiring more strain specific and more molecular based methods for identifying uh, probiotics to the strain level. We progress to slide number eight. So strain specific PCR assays, which again, we've, we've captured in these USP monographs. I want to give a couple examples. So in an ideal situation, it's very easy to identify a unique genomic region. In this case, it typically takes one assay targeted on this unique region to identify our IFF probiotic strain from all other probiotics or other bacteria in public databases or in our own uh, genomic databases. It's typically easily verifiable by gel electrophoresis. It's intended for individual strains, but it's often applicable with multi-strain blends because the strain, the region of that was identified is, is so unique that we don't have to worry about cross-reaction from other strains. Progressing to slide number nine. But what we typically see is that highly clonal strains are identified. And again, that can be within our own portfolio or in the public realm or manufactured by a competitor. When this is the case, multiple assays and sequencing are typically required in order to uniquely identify our probiotic strain. It also leads to less optimal design conditions because we don't have a lot of unique regions to, to uh, choose from, so we're left to designing whether that region is good for PCR or not, we're left designing around that unique region. And it's intended for individual strains, but it's not always applicable in multi-strain blends. So if you think about designing an assay for something that in the, in the middle you can see we have two strains of uh, bacteria which have a pairwise identity of 99.9%, meaning they're 99.9% .9 genetically ident identical. So once you mix those two strains into a product, it can be difficult to apply some of these uh, strain-specific assays to that mixed product. Okay, so we can progress to the next slide, number 10. I want to now move into probiotic identification, or enumeration, excuse me. Bacterial enumeration evaluated using nutrient agar was developed over 100 years ago. And agar plate enumeration methods are used to determine potency for quality release at IFF. But agar plate enumeration methods are optimized for each IFF strain. And this is really important to understand because the methods are internally validated with specific techniques, reagents, temperatures, incubation time. And those results can differ if any of those those factors are altered. And even small changes in, for example, rehydration time or incubation time can make a major difference in the enumeration result that you get and could lead to, you know, unnecessary halts in production or re uh, rejection of product. This is why it's really important to understand what the IFF technique for enumeration of that product is and to make sure that you're, you're following the product or the the protocol specifically. Agar techniques also have several weaknesses to consider. Current methods are only capable of total bacteria or sometimes genus or species specific counts. They have an estimated variability between 15 and 35 percent. However, those differences can be even greater. I think, you know, looking in at an internal lab, that can be a high estimation or, or an accurate to high estimation. But when you talk about different labs, especially those with no probiotic experience, the difference in, um, and the variability can get even higher than that. IFF is working on next generation enumeration methods with reduced variability and increased specificity. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna now present a couple of those techniques. The first one is genus level auger plate count, and which adds specificity to plate counting. And so we have two currently, bifidobacterium selection, which uses MRS supplemented with mucuricin and cysteine. Examples of strains that this could be used to detect is BLO4, BB18, HNO9, B420, BI26. These are strains from our portfolio. The problem is if those are mixed, you would only get one bifidobacterium count, but it would tell you the bifidobacterium count and it would not tell you, it would not include any other species, for example, uh, lactobacillus, sorry, genus. Lactobacillus. And the other technique is for lactobacillus selection. This is based on the lactobacillus 
genus prior to the new um, the splitting of the of the genus into multiple genera. But it is an MRS technique again, but it's using a micro aerobic conditions rather than the typical anaerobic conditions used for lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. And that alone is enough to eliminate bifidobacterium from the count and only only count lactobacillus strains. And some examples of those strains would be GG, LA14, NCFM, LP1 and 5, or LPC37. Okay, we can go to the next slide, number 12. The last technique that I want to talk about today is droplet digital PCR. We get a lot of questions about this. It is our, one of our newest techniques that we are developing. It, it represents the latest development in DNA quantification. So what's digital PCR? A brief overview of droplet digital PCR. And there is another technique which is similar called chip digital PCR. What it does is it partitions samples into oil droplets and uses a Poisson distribution to extrapolate absolute counts from the number of partitions, showing amplification of single gene targets. And that's a mouthful. So on the very bottom, I have a diagram from um, BioRAD's website. We use a BioRAD system for, for DDPCR. And if you look at the, the far left box, you may have a mixed, a mixed strain sample, the green, uh, squares being the strain that you're interested in, the target strain, and the black squares being an off strain that you're not interested in enumerating. You'll take that sample and you add it to a PCR mix, and then that will be formed into droplets. Because there are less copies of the sample than there are droplets formed, some droplets will end up with a copy of your target, others will not. And then you will perform PCR or thermal cycling, which will amplify, that reaction will amplify the target sequence only in droplets that contain that target sequence. Other droplets will not be amplified. Those droplets can then be counted, and based on the number of amplified droplets compared to the number of non-amplified droplets, you can determine how many copies of your target were in the original sample. So that tells you how many copies of DNA were in your original sample, which is great. But for probiotics, what we're really interested in is viable cells. So this isn't enough, and this is where viability drop a digital PCR or VDD PCR comes into play. We use a combination of PMA and EMA, which are viability dyes. And they, if you look at the diagram in the upper right-hand corner, what they do is they eliminate dead cells from being amplified in the PCR reaction. That can be done either by membrane integrity. So if a cell has an intact membrane, the dye will not be able to enter and bind to the DNA and exclude it from count or if it has active efflux. So if the pump is able to, if the cell is able to pump the dye out before it binds to the DNA, then it will also be counted as a live cell. So the dyes really exclude dead cells from the count, and therefore we're only counting viable cells DNA. So that gives us a viable count. VDDPCR offers a lot of improvement over agar clay counting methods, including faster time to results. So we see four to eight hours, we're getting enumeration results as compared to 24 to 72 in clay count and other culture-based methods. And it's more accurate. So uh, in a paper from Hansen, uh, Sarah Hansen, one of our uh, former colleagues and myself and some other Colleagues, we, we found that the method variability was 1 to 3% in droplet digital PCR compared to 12 or 20, 12 to 20% with plate count results. And we also found in that study, in the kind of bottom right diagram, that there's good correlation with a number of our probiotic strains between our viable digital PCR technique and plate count. Okay, so moving on to slide number 13. Just to give a, a brief overview for those who are interested in the drop of digital PCR method, kind of the difference in uh, technique. Both typically are starting out with a probiotic sample, often a freeze-dried probiotic. So it's being rehydrated and diluted. For plate count following the bottom arm, you would then put the diluted sample onto a plate. We do an, a pour plate technique. So we would pour agar, liquefied agar on top, swirl to mix it, let it solidify, then we would incubate it, and we would count the, re the resulting colony. And that would give us colony forming units, or CFU, per gram of the starting material. 
for drop of digital PCR, on the other hand, you would take that diluted sample, you would perform the viability treatment, which would exclude dead cells. Then you can halt that reaction. You can then lyse the cells to make PCR easier, so make it easier to access the DNA of those live cells. Mix that, PC, that sample with PCR reagents. Form droplets. Thermal cycle the droplets to, to allow the reaction to take place. And then you count the resulting droplets and, and you determine the number of positive droplets to negative droplets, which then tells you the number of viable copies of, D, copies of DNA from viable cells, or what we typically call viable copies per gram of starting material. So you can progress to slide number 14. In conclusion, I just want to wrap up by reiterating that identification and enumeration of IFF probiotics are strain and product specific. It requires a lot of intricate knowledge of our portfolio and our formulation techniques to make sure that you're selecting the correct method. And even if you select the correct method, if you're not able to correctly interpret the results, you may also lead yourself down the wrong path and, and find that you have not, that you are not getting the answer that you're looking for. Improvements to technology and techniques are providing a lot of opportunity and challenges really for IFF and the probiotic industry. And we're, at, you know, as I've demonstrated in this presentation, we're working on those along with industry partners to try and advance the technology and improve the efficacy of probiotics through incorporating these new techniques. And, you know, I think what it comes down to and why we're doing this webinar today is that partnering with the correct lab can make all the difference. And the work that Eurofins has done with IFF on our How Are You probiotic line is, is more than I can say for, for a lot of the labs that we see. We, you know, we are, constantly in contact, talking about new products and formulation. We're talking about new method development. You know, they have really good knowledge of how to test our probiotics. They have knowledge of how, to, how our products are formulated so that they can select the correct method. And with that, you know, I want to, um, you can progress to the next slide. I want to wrap up before I go too far into Eurofins because they're going to do their thing. Um, but I wanted to thank you know, the probiotic development team for all the work that they've done on, on these techniques to make them, you know, what they are today and to continue to advance the technology to try and improve what they are. And I want to thank the, the DigiDrop team for their work on the Drop Digital PCR because it's one of the major efforts that we're making in the probiotic industry and within IFF to improve the quality of testing and the quality of our products uh, through analytical techniques at IFF. And for my last slide, just some references to the papers. I know these slides will be sent out, but some of the papers that were presented in this presentation, if anyone's interested in following up, we have those here. With that, I'll hand it over to Anjay. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, can everyone hear me? Genevieve, are you there? Can you see my slides? Everything looks great. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Anthony, for that uh, and and that that comment at the end. It, it it's it's true. I think um, you know, partnering with our our probiotic manufacturers is is an important piece in order to deliver consistent results. Um, using, you know, the, the correct methods, which I'll get into in a lot more detail in my presentation. So, uh, you know, my name is Andrzej Benkowski. I'm the Senior Technical Leader for Probiotics and Dietary Supplements with Eurofins, based out of our laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin, um, down the road from Anthony and the IFF team. Uh, so, what I'm going to be discussing today, first, I'm going to I'm going to give a give an overview of probiotic label claims and how they are unique compared to traditional dietary ingredients, uh, followed by how to verify uh, said claims um, for potency using our gold standard plate count enumeration methods and uh, delve into some of the nuances of those methods and uh, and how they can uh, they can be utilized in in order to 
um, maximize recovery, minimize variability, et cetera. And then I, I'm going to touch on a few options for identification. I know Anthony went into uh, a lot of great detail on some options there, but I, I wanted to touch on just a couple that, that we're offering here at our Madison lab. So first, um, probiotic label claims when milligrams is not and will never be enough. So just to level set our uh, my scope, I'm going to be discussing probiotics as dietary ingredients in dietary supplements in the United States. Of course, things and the regulations change depending on what country and what format. Um, so that that's what we're going to talk about here. And in accordance with the Code of Federal Regulation, dietary ingredients must be listed by weight on the supplement facts panel. Uh, the problem with listing probiotics by weight is that it actually does not inform the consumer of the actual quantity of probiotics present. Uh, for one, because uh, the cellular mass will also include dead or inactivated cells, which are not considered probiotics. Um, in accordance with the WHO definition, which is live microorganisms, which when administered in adequate amounts can confer a health benefit to the host. Um, also, uh, uh, lyophilized raw materials can vary greatly in potency per gram. So you may have one strain um, that whose potency is like 100 billion CFUs per gram, and another that is that is 500 or even more. CFUs per gram. And so, you know, listing in milligrams really does not give an accurate representation of what uh, uh, the quantity of probiotics present. So to address this, the FDA published a draft guidance for the probiotic industry in 2018, essentially saying that along with milligrams and listing by weight, um, manufacturers can also list their probiotic content in colony forming units or CFUs. Uh, they also mentioned that they are monitoring the development of new technologies and their potential impact on the use of other units besides CFU, for example, uh, using flow cytometry and providing units uh, as, as active fluorescing units, for example. So the draft guidance uh, was published and they gave uh, a lot of great information on how to formulate a uh, probiotic supplement facts panel, which you can see an example on the right. Um, so of course, first the quantity must be listed in terms of weight um, by, you know, it, by regulation, it needs that, that, uh, that moniker. And then next to that, the declaration of quantity and CFUs needs to be expressed in a manner that is clearly separate and readily distinguishable from the weight. That declaration of CFUs should be formatted in clear terms, for example, spelling out the word billion and, and not putting it in a format such as scientific notation that may not be understood by the average consumer. The declaration of quantity in CFUs needs to be accurate and not misleading and does not render misleading other aspects of the supplement facts panel or other aspects of the product label. The declaration of quantity in CFUs measures only live microbial ingredients and does not include dead cells. Uh, going back to the definition of probiotics, of course, uh, live microbial dietary ingredients in a proprietary blend need to be listed in descending order of predominance by weight, and that the product label otherwise complies with all applicable laws and regulations. So general information and best practices on pro probiotic label claims. Um, we like to see the claim made at the end of shelf life and not the time of manufacture. Uh, I believe that is misleading to put a label claim at the time of manufacture because traditional probiotic lactic acid bacteria will slowly degrade over time. And so the consumer at any given point will not know the actual quantity present. And for all we know, there could be rapid degradation post manufacturing uh, by the time you know the shelf life uh, comes around a couple years later. Uh, strains need to be listed, so the microorganisms listed should be listed to the strain level. Again, this is, this is uh, based on uh, strain-specific health claims. Uh, the, the clinical trials performed are done to the strain level. The potency of each strain should be listed in, listed in CFUs. This, this can be a challenge with multi-strain blend products. Uh, for one, because 
uh, the way that we measure CFUs it does not have the specificity as Anthony mentioned. And so if you're talking about a complex blend of, of lactic acid bacteria, for example, in a product, uh, this simply may not be possible. So there is the option of listing CFUs um, uh, by input, taking the value of uh, the strain COA um, in CFU per gram, and then extrapolating the amount of CFUs um, in a product by, by the amount of milligrams added. The serving side should be listed. It needs to be accurate uh, to the efficacious dose. Again, going back to a probiotic needs to demonstrate a health claim, this is proven through a clinical study. That clinical study has an efficacious dose, and that dose should be present in the product in order to demonstrate that health claim. Storage conditions should be listed. Some probiotics need to be stored refrigerated. Others can be stored at room temperature. And of course, health claims as allowed by law and substantiated by the, by the, by the clinical studies I mentioned. Um, ISAP put out a nice infographic uh, here on the right um, that helps decipher a probiotic label. So be able to give recommended use. A lot of the same things I mentioned, the dosage, um, colony forming units, again, at the time, uh, avoiding stating the CFU at the time of manufacture, because it doesn't account for that decline, like I said. Genus, species, and strain, company name, and the use by expiration date, storage information, of course. So in order to verify the, the claims made on a label uh, specific to potency first, um, we need to confirm the measured value of CFUs using the gold standard plate count enumeration method. And I'm going to take a deep dive into, into these methods and, uh, and some of the nuances associated with them. So here's an overview of a plate count method. Now, Anthony spoke uh, in some detail about this already. Essentially, what we want to do is take a concentrated material, uh, dilute it, and, and in a series of stepwise dilutions, until we can get to a concentration of cells that can form uh, colonies within a countable range that can be estimated accurately on a Petri plate. Typically, that's anywhere from 25 to 250 or 30 to 300 colonies. Um, and the CFU, by definition, is that colony forming unit, which is a probiotic cell who has the ability to replicate under ideal growth conditions. Of course, these methods have a number of challenges. First and foremost, they have quite a bit of intrinsic variability. Um, we use the 30% variance as a general rule of thumb and an industry standard. But of course, this number can vary depending on the strain, the method, and of course, the matrix um, that it's inputted in. Um, and, and as Anthony mentioned too, you know, once you start talking about inter-laboratory variability, that number can increase quite a bit looking at different methods and things like that. Um, there's a lack of specificity with these enumeration methods. So we're unable to enumerate individual species in a blend. There are, you know, there are a few methods here and there that may be able to distinguish, like for example, an acidophilus in a blend. But in general, um, the, the, the best we can do for specificity is, is getting to the genus level. And we definitely can't enumerate uh, by plate count to the strain level. It's just not, not possible. Finally, there's a lack of harmonization with these play count methods. Of course, we have standard methods such as the ISO standards. So there's USP methods as well. Um, and then of course, we have uh, manufacturer methods. So every strain manufacturer has their own developed and validated enumeration methods that are tailored to their strain portfolio. Here at, at our lab in, in, in Madison, we also have internally developed and validated enumeration methods that, that can be implied uh, in particular situations that, that deem them required. For example, like when a product may contain two different manufacturer strains, we can, we can use our internal method to verify those claims. And then sometimes you'll see um, product specific methods. So there may be a unique property to a material like micro encapsulation, or a unique format, um, you know, I'm thinking like a solid food or something that requires uh, specific steps in order to um, release those cells or, or get the recovery and get an accurate representation of the cellular population present. 
So some key points uh, with these methods um, that can greatly affect the recovery and the variability associated with them. Um, two, of, you know, two of the main ones that I could think of uh, is the way that the sample is homogenized. So these formats are, are typically, you know, when you're talking about dietary supplements, they're they're in a solid form, and we need to put them into a suspension. Um, with the diluent, and that suspension needs to be homogeneous and representative of the cellular concentration in a per milliliter basis in order to get to get an accurate representation and an accurate quantification. Um, uh, along with that, the growth media that you're using for these plate count enumerations can can greatly affect recovery, um, and and using the correct growth media is imperative um, when you're talking about accurate and precise results. Some other factors that, that can affect um, method recovery include the initial dilution ratio. So typically these are one to 10 dilutions where we're taking 10 grams of materials and putting it in uh, nine parts or 90 milliliters of, of diluent. But that, that maybe need to be adjusted, for example, um, like uh, doing a one to 100 dilution um, in order to, to better homogenize or, or get a better suspension. Um, this also can help when uh, one to 10 dilution, there may be other active ingredients in the material that could drop the pH of that suspension, causing rapid degradation. And one thing we wanna, of course, always avoid when we're testing these products by plate count methods is any sort of um, negative interaction during the testing. You know, these materials are, are, are in a dry form and all of a sudden you're, you're reviving them in a liquid and we want to make sure that 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 revive step doesn't actually start killing things off because you're not going to get a good representation of what's in your product if that's the case. Um, different diluents can 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 affect results. So you know, are you using an MRS broth, a nutritious broth for for lactic acid bacteria, or do you need to use like a phosphate buffer to neutralize or or reduce the propensity of a, of a drastic pH change in that initial dilution. Finally, incubation conditions, you know, what temperature, um, how long you're incubating can, can affect um, um, the growth rate there. Uh, um, some, some charts on the, on the right, we have a couple of internal studies we did looking at different media for a Saccharomyces boulardii enumeration and a selective bifidobacteria enumeration. And you can see while, you know, while they're comparable, uh, we do see a slight trend for uh, YGC agar giving slightly better recovery compared to YEPD and TOS growth media giving slightly better recovery um, compared to the MRS with um, selective reagents. So the key to these methods and, and what we're striving for is to maximize the recovery and minimizing the variability. Uh, maximizing the recovery is going to allow you to not have to put as much into your formulation. And of course, minimizing variability will reduce the amount of overage required when you're testing these products and formulating them. Uh, uh, method variability as well as shelf life degradation need to be taken into account. So you're hitting that label claim at the end of shelf life. So a, a, a few ways to help maximize recovery. Uh, the type of homogenization required. So uh, most commonly we see stomaching as, as the homogenization method of choice. This works really well for powdered samples. This is like a, a parostatic uh, uh, motion using two paddles that you, uh, you're you introducing um, and, you're, and you're homogenizing a, a sample in a, in a sample bag. This works really well um, for a lot of different types of samples. Um, but there may be uh, instances when uh, we may need to try a different technique. So is the, is, are the materials you know, in a finished food or a, or a solid food format? Perhaps stomaching isn't going to give you that homogenous suspension, suspension and you need to look at something like, like blending the sample. <clears throat> um, sometimes these cells, uh, depending on the strain, they have the propensity to form microscopic clumps. And so uh, uh, applying a technique such as sonication to help break up those microscopic clumps um, can help improve recovery because one clump of 10 cells may show up as a single colony forming unit, 
um, when it's actually 10 cells present. So you can see how something like that could potentially affect the recovery and the numbers um, of CFU present when you're using these techniques. Um, things like stirring can be employed. Uh, sometimes a combination of techniques may be, may be used. So perhaps you, know, you homogenize at a macro level using stomaching, and then you take that desonication to break up any microscopic clumps. Again, we're looking to maximize that recovery, and this is one, one step in the procedure that can, that can really be evaluated to help do that. Uh, a couple other things to consider is how long to stomach or how long to homogenize. Maybe you're working with a highly sen oxygen sensitive bifidobacteria where, you know, if you're stomaching for uh, minutes, it, there, you could be incorporating extra oxygenation and, and again, causing that rapid degradation that we're, we're trying to avoid. So, you know, minimizing that amount of time, getting a homogenous suspension, but, but minimizing that, that, that length of time in order to prevent that degradation is something to evaluate. These methods sometimes incorporate an initial dilution hold time. You know, we're looking at lyophilized or freeze-dried materials that are in a, you know, in a somewhat dormant state um, in the product. And so holding the, holding the initial dilution in a, in a broth or in a diluent helps revive those dormant cells of course, you don't want to have that go too long where you start to see the cells actively replicating. You know, something like 10 minutes to 20 minutes, uh, up to 30 minutes is, is typical hold times we see for these. And these are all easy applications to test. You know, if you're developing your own method, maybe you want to check different steps along the way and, and try different variables to see, you know, is this going to help improve my recovery um, when we're evaluating a particular product in a particular matrix. You may want to consider tempering diluents. This is helpful when you're homogenizing like gummy material, for example. A warm diluent can aid in the dissolution of those gummies. Heat shocks are, are often um, used when you're testing spore samples um, where you're only looking for uh, the spore count. So a heat shock is going to knock down any vegetative growth and allow for the germination of the spores and, and, and giving you an accurate representation um, using that particular technique. And a lot of these answers are going to be driven by the strains present and, of course, the sample matrix with which they're incorporated. So as I mentioned, most, most probiotic strain manufacturers have their own optimized methods, and these are based on standard methods with tweaks um, to maximize recovery and minimize variability. Some methods are more robust than others. There may be you know, a single method that a manufacturer utilizes for their entire portfolio, or a manufacturer may have a specific method for every single strain um, or, or some combination in between. And it, it just depends on you know, the work that they've put in to, to validate and evaluate um, each method, again, they're trying to maximize recovery in the same way that we are when we're testing finished products. As I said uh, already, we have our internally developed and validated enumeration methods. We also have a, a, a what we call our Eurofins Testing Partners Program. And this is a, a one-of-a-kind program in the probiotics industry where we're actively working with our probiotic strain suppliers to become qualified to run their specific enumeration procedures. And then we offer that to our joint customers so that a customer that's purchasing a how are you strain will know that in order to get third, third party verification, they'll know that uh, you know, my laboratory will be able to run the same method that the IFFQC lab ran and that we're competent in said method. So you know, we're demonstrating competency by performing ring trials, um, and, and then, of course, you know, being in communication with the manufacturers is an important piece as well, you know, making sure we're aware of any method updates and things like that. There's a link there if you want to learn more about that program. And I, I can't go, uh, I can't give a webinar without at least touching on some of the alternative and emerging technologies for probiotic um, potency uh, verifications. Uh, that are going to measure viable cells. Anthony gave a great overview of digital droplet PCR. That's one example. Flow cytometry is another uh, another uh, emerging technology for the quantification of probiotic cells, and this is using uh, dual nucleic acid viability stains to measure, um, um, you know, the number of viable cells. 
you have quantitative PCR, which is similar to DPCR, but it but it requires a standard curve to evaluate it. Or you can simply put the cells under a microscope and, and do direct cell counting, though that can be fairly tedious and laborious. Um, I don't recommend looking under a microscope for eight hours at a time. It's it's uh, a challenge and hard on the eyes. So we have these methods, but how do we know that they're giving you the right number? Well, we need to ensure that the method is fit for purpose by performing method validations or verifications. Uh, method validation can be, um, can be uh, developed with using guidance documents such as AOAC, ISO, ICH, and USP for the various parameters and acceptance criteria, or perhaps there's a, you know, your internal quality system has their own specific parameters for a method validation. Validations are used for new methods and, and new products. Um, for example, you know, our internally developed methods have been fully validated. Um, verification uh, is a little bit different than validation in that it's typically less parameters and it's used to qualify a previously validated method on a different material, uh, which we call a matrix extension or at a different location such as uh, you know, us verifying our ability to run a previously validated manufacturer method. A verification can also be applied when we're making small changes to a method um, that's already been validated to ensure that there's no drastic changes um, in results when we make those changes in the procedure. So some parameters for plate count methods, uh, we wanna look at accuracy, how close is the measured value uh, that we're getting uh, to the true value uh, that, that is there. And there's a couple of different ways we can address this. Uh, precision looks at you know, how, how close in relationship uh, multiple tests or multiple results are when tested in a single bench session. Uh, repeatability starts adding in different variables, such as how the method performs on different days, using different lots of media, uh, things like that, different equipment. Uh, reproducibility is, is how the analyst or how the, how the method performs when being tested by different analysts or different operators. Robustness looks at um, small changes to the method and how they may affect um, the recovery. So things, parameters we'll look at when evaluating robustness um, uh, are often things like incubation time and temperature, uh, uh, among others. Um, you know, we'll wanna look at selectivity, specificity, um, if applicable, if the method's selective, LOD, LOQ, you know, how, how low can we go before we start seeing interference, interference, and then linearity of the method. So can we get accurate results at different concentrations of, of probiotic when compared to um, other material present in, in, the, in, the, in the product? So some examples of validation acceptance criteria. We often use a t-test to demonstrate no statistically significant differences. So things we can evaluate as you know, no differences between days, lots of media, analysts for reproducibility, and small changes to the method for robustness. When we look at precision, we wanna, we, we're looking at uh, percent relative standard deviations. So that's shown in the chart um, on, the, on the bottom right. This is a precision evaluation for our internal total probiotic enumeration method. You can see we did uh, six replicates and then we take the average and standard deviation and from that we get the percent RSD and we see that we're compliant with a less than 15% acceptance criterion. Accuracy evaluation, one, one way to do this is, is to take the candidate method, our internal method, and compare it to a reference method, like an ISO standard. And that's what's uh, exemplified in the, in the table on, on the top. So we took our internal uh, enumeration method again, and we ran it against an ISO standard. And we looked at the recovery, and you could see with the mean recoveries, we're hovering right around 100 plus or minus 10% for those. So that's compliant, and we deem the method accurate. Um, a coefficient of determination or R squared value uh, greater than 95%. This, this can be used when you're looking at linearity. So that, that's an example of linearity on the right, um, looking at the expected value of the, of the probiotic potency compared to the value that's obtained when we measured it. And then the table here um, is, is an example of a robustness evaluation. 
So uh, we're looking at serial diluent volumes, nine mils versus 99 mils, or performing one to 10 serial dilutions versus one to 100. Looking at different incubation temperatures, so the method calls for 35. We we stress that at and try incubating at 30 degrees and 42, and then counting the colonies at, on different days. The method calls for um, you know incubation for three days. We we read the colonies at two and four respectively to show that you know making these small changes may not affect the recovery in the end. What you can see is for the majority of those changes. We maintained that 70 to 125 percent recovery. You can see, with one exception, at 48 hours and 30 degrees Celsius, uh, it was not enough time to form visible colonies. So that's helpful information, uh, you know, when we're evaluating these in real time. Uh, if any deviation, uh, protocol deviations need to happen, we know that you know at 48 hours and 30 degrees, we're not going to get growth. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I, Anthony gave a lot of great information on probiotic identification. I'm going to touch on just two examples. Um, of course, there are many other options for identifying probiotics. Again, this goes back to verifying label claims. We need to make sure that what we're putting on the label and the organisms and strains present on the label are actually what are in the product. And so two examples of that that we're routinely performing here at the at the laboratory in Madison include PCR identification or polymerase chain reaction. So this is identification using strain or species specific primers in order to observe amplification of the target organism. This is based on the principle of enzymatic replication of nucleic acids. So first you have denaturation. Uh, the, the DNA is heated at 94 degrees Celsius. This breaks the, the, the DNA double helix and makes two separate single strands. And then we lower the temperature anywhere from 50 to 70 degrees C. This allows the, the strain or species specific primers to bind or anneal to their complementary DNA sequence. And finally, the reaction is then heated to 72 degrees. This is the optimal temperature for the DNA polymerase to act, and that polymerase then extends the primers using the free-floating nucleotides uh, and, and adding them onto the DNA template in a sequential manner. And with one cycle then, a single segment of target double-stranded DNA is amplified into two separate pieces. If you continue the cycling, you'll continue to uh, increase the number of pieces of DNA exponentially. And what you wind up with is uh, what we see on the right here, which is uh, uh, agarose gel showing amplification of a particular band. So some benefits to PCR ID, again, high sensitivity, specificity, um, the relative speed to results is, is quick, uh, it's fairly cost effective, and you have the ability to multiplex. Some of the drawbacks of PCR, and this is good, the, the, the method is only as good and specific as the design of the primer, and the primer design and verification of the primer design needs to be uh, robust in order to make sure that it's not actually amplifying any non-target sequence. So that can vary, you know, depending on on the scope of the project. For example, you know, may be able to design a primer that works well in a particular blend um, and only for that blend, um, at, or you may find, you know, SNP level differences. And develop a primer that can be applied universally, um, or, or more universally, and more to more different blends, and, and show more specificity there. Um, I'm considering that a drawback because it, it really uh, necessitates good primer design. Um, some strain subspecies are difficult to discriminate, as as Anthony mentioned. Um, one example, you know, that I could think of is looking at Bifidobacterium longum subspecies longum versus Infantis. Um, high LOD, possibility of sample interference, and of course you may amplify DNA from dead cells. The other uh, identification technology I wanna briefly uh, discuss is, is uh, metagenomic or whole genome sequencing. Uh, we're doing this routinely here in our lab, and this is uh, the termination of the entirety or nearly the entirety of the DNA sequences of an organism's or a group of organisms genome in, in one run. We're using long read sequencing using an Oxford nanopore gridiron, as you can see here on the right. And there's a summary of the technology that you can read um, 
if you would like to you know obtain the slides after the fact uh, so the benefits of whole genome sequencing this is a great way to characterize um, uh, unknown blend where PCR identification you need to know the target of course in order to show that it's present um, you can take an unknown blend of bacteria run a metagenomic sequence and determine the blends present long reads eliminate amplification bias sample interference is less likely because of this accuracy of greater than 90 percent 95 percent and you can get a rough proportion proportionality of of uh of strains present though it's it's difficult to extrapolate that back to the actual quantities some of the drawbacks it's a much higher cost slower tat and of course it's only as good as the database you're using to reference the sequences you can't always get to the strain level in this respect but bioinformatics tools um, can give you the necessary information um, in order to do so. So to sum up, um, some key takeaways. Label claims for probiotic products are unique in the fact that the declaration of the active ingredient is based on a live microorganism um, and verification of what is present on the label is imperative for a quality product that the consumer can trust. Again, we can't use milligrams to, to define probiotic potency. It needs a colony forming unit, which makes probiotics unique in the dietary ingredient space. To verify the potency of a probiotic, uh, probiotic potency on a label, cultural plate count assays are employed and measured in colony forming units. And of course, we know that plate counts have the drawbacks of variability, lack of specificity, and lack of harmonization. While the same in principle, different plate count methods have the propensity to produce different results based on different modes of recovery, and key steps within enumeration methods can drastically affect recovery, as I mentioned, things like homogenization, growth media, et cetera. Uh, cultural enumeration methods should be fit for purpose as demonstrated by validations and or verifications. And finally, to verify the identification of probiotics present in a product and listed on a label, a wide variety of techniques can be applied Two examples I gave being PCR ID or metagenomic sequencing, and the type of identification method used will depend on the scenario. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Uh, and a quick plug, come visit us at Supply Side West. We have a booth in the IPA Probiotic Resource Center, 5755 Pod C. Uh, and again, thank you for your time. Thank you both for your presentations today. Uh, we're going to move into a short Q&A session. Um, we got some questions in the chat during the presentations that I'm going to ask. Um, if anyone else has any questions, you can submit them through the chat. Um, we are getting to, to the end of our time, so we might not get to all of them um, during this Q&A session, but we'll follow up with you afterward. And a reminder that you will receive uh, a copy of today's webinar recording and the slides via email within the next three business days or so. All right, with that, the first question is, are the probiotics clinically proven probiotics? Do they fit the FAO slash uh, WHO definition of probiotics? And Anthony, that was asked during your presentation. Sure, so yeah, I can only speak to our portfolio, but yes, they are all probiotics. They all fit the FAO WHO definition of a probiotic. Now, as far as clinical claims, some strains have a clinical claim, others do not. And so that's part of where our formulation team really will understand what the customer is looking for, what claims they want to make, and then we will incorporate the correct combination of clinically proven strains and potentially um, add additional non-clinically proven strains for, for, other, for other benefits, such as, you know, some people want a consortia, so 14 strains. We may not have 14 strains that have clinically proven benefits, but there is plenty of research that shows a, a good mixture of bacteria is beneficial to gut health, for example. So uh, many of our back, of our portfolio does have clinical claims, but others do not. So that's a, a decision that you make at a time of formulation. Okay, great, thank you. Um, our next question, uh, this one is for Anjay. Uh, you mentioned some of the advantages of flow cytometry over plate counts for enumeration. Why isn't flow cyt uh, cytometry being utilized as much compared to plate counts for verification of potency if there are some clear-cut advantages to the technology? Sure, yeah. So, you know, flow cytometry can give you real-time data 
it's been shown to be more precise than plate counts. And of course, it can give you a better character characterization of the cells present. So not only live, but also injured and dead cells present. The main drawback of flow cytometry is that it's not giving you a CFU. And again, our gold standard and what's recommended in the 2018 guidance is to label our products with a CFU potency. Um, uh, Flow cytometry gives results in active fluorescing units, and it's difficult to develop a correlation between the two values. So at the time of manufacture, typically AFUs and CFUs are, are, are relatively close and complementary, complementary to each other, but as the product ages and the different ways that the viability is measured, you know, with it being uh, a, a plate count being a cell's ability to replicate versus flow cytometry, um, a cell's uh, or, or an intact cell membrane as defined by ability, you start to see a divergence. And that divergence may be strain dependent. Um, of course, it's time dependent. And so there's not like a universal correlation between the two units. And I see that as one of the biggest hurdles in, uh, in shifting the way we test um, these materials away from the plate count and to an alternative technology or an emerging technology um, such as flow cytometry. Great, thank you. Um, so we, I know that we are just past our end time. I'm gonna ask one final question before we wrap up. Um, is drop it, droplet digital PCR ex, an accepted technique by regulatory bodies? That's a great question. Yeah, we're working towards that end goal and we are trying to to make some, some validated methods with, you know, some accredited uh, method bodies such as USP or AOAC. Currently, I would say they're not. Uh, and, and one of the biggest hurdles Anjay hit on is that it's not equivalent to CFU always in every situation, particularly during storage and gathering that data, you know, over a two year storage data for our portfolio of over, you know, 25 probiotic strains is, is a lot of work. So we're, we're working on that. Currently, it's not, but it is also capable of some things that plate count isn't capable of. So in that respect, it depends on what regulatory is asking for. And if regulatory is asking for something that an, a validated method, or not a validated method, we can validate internally, but what a, you know, a monographed or a official method can't do, then we may have to go to those alternative techniques and regulatory understands that, that hurdle. So there's many facets to that question, I would say. Thank you. All right, um, so we still have some more questions. Um, we'll follow up with those after today's presentation is completed. Um, thank you everyone who was able to join us. And thank you, Anjay and Anthony, for your time and your expertise. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody.